so welcome back everybody. Um, really excited for this next session that we're going to have. I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Brighton Samatanga. Um, I actually met Professor Samatanga um, earlier this year um, and we started talking about the initiatives we're both working on. We talked about Visibility STEM Africa and he told us about this new cool biotech institute that he was setting up in Zimbabwe and We've been working together from there, and we're really excited to get that he gets to share his story with you today. So um, Brighton is the founder and the CEO of the Biotech Institute, which is a hybrid academic biotech institute located in Harare, Zimbabwe. He's also a professor for physics of biological and soft matter at Leipzig University in Germany. He holds a PhD degree in physical chemistry and molecular biophysics from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. He pursued two postdoc research stays focused on single molecule biophysics in Munster and Leipzig. And his current interests are to create innovative, self sustainable, high tech institutions in Africa that can empower people through cutting edge education and research and translation of research into products, processes, and services in all sectors in the bioeconomy. Thank you so much for being here, Brighton. We're really looking forward to this talk, and the floor is yours. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for the uh, nice introduction. And I'd like to thank I think, the Visibility STEM team for uh, inviting me to give uh, a talk here. I think you guys are really doing quite tremendous work. And, you know, it gives me really a lot of pleasure to really add my two cents uh, to this platform. But I think um, I love what you guys are doing. And I hope this is actually sort of the seed uh, for bigger things to come. Um, so today, I think, I think, um, so Natasha and Natasha asked me basically to give a talk and I decided, okay, I, you know, I'm not really one of those people who like to really share my personal stories, but, you know, they said, okay, personal flavor to it would be very interesting. So I'll try my best to share, uh, this with you. And I think I've seen a talk, like also try to share and what lessons I learned and, uh, what were sort of my inspirations. And I thought instead of maybe just giving you a list of, you know, you know, what was what and when, I would just basically then just go through uh, sort of my whole kind of career trajectory. And, and I guess from each step along the way, I think one or two of you, depending at which stage you are in your career profile, you might pick, you know, one or, one, one or two things that make sense. Uh, not everything has to, has to make sense, of course. So I, I titled my, 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 my talk sort of curious, crazy, and maybe a little bit insane. Um, you know, uh, the title of the talk is a, is a little bit, um, you know, sort of molded upon what I would call sort of my uh, nonlinear, sort of diffuse by steel focused trajectory. You know, there are many different scientists out there. I think the most classic example, and which is actually the one that is basically, um, you know, prayed is, is basically, you know, you have a baby boy or a baby girl, they have a dream, they want to do astronomy. And they knew, they know this since they are one or two years old, and they just go on that path and they become the best astronomers in the world, which is, which is really fantastic. Uh, now I come from a different type of breed, you know, you, we just know what we are good at and uh, what makes us have fun and basically everything that came next was simply a culmination on just piggybacking on my own strength and still trying to have fun with it. So I, I don't think I don't think any 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 trajectory is nonetheless important. So so I, I thought say since in my sort of um in a non dogmatic kind of career path, I would maybe, you know, just title myself this way. Uh, so my, my, my slides are not working my side, so um, I just asked, I think, one of the team members to uh, do this for me. So can you please uh, move to the next slide? So the very beginning, uh, I think on the left side, you see, I think, me and my mom. I think without this woman, I think this talk would not be happening. Uh, so this is, I think, the backbone of what else was to come. Uh, sort of really the sort of power and inspiration. And this was the lady who was like in my family. You know, we don't, we didn't come out from a very high up family. Um, education was key, you know, 
So, you know, we, we could budget, she could budget, move money around and, and so forth, you know, say, you're not getting this, you're not getting that, but everybody gets to get to education, you know. And my coming here was to Europe to, to further my education was a lot of sacrifices here and there. But I think this, this lady was very sort of instrumental um, in this sort of in this whole career path. So I think I should give, you know, thanks to her. And this also goes sort of, you know, to really sort of um, put in the center sort of uh, the women in Africa that really push you know, they are not so much recognized, but they really push for their career, uh, for their kids to have sort of wonderful careers. So I'm from Chishawasha. So uh, this is a, a, a nice, beautiful place in the rural Zimbabwe. Uh, we also have a house in the city, but mainly we grew up in, the, in, the, in this village. Uh, and Ria, you see like a picture from, I think, last year when I managed to take uh, even a lot of my colleagues uh, from, here, uh, from here in Europe and my family and now you see them in this one of these round hot kitchens um, uh, in Shishawasha and, and, and really, they really loved the place. I think it was, was really good. So it's like coming back to the community and now also putting it on the map. And I think one of the main points really here is, you know, most of us have sort of different sort of upbringings, different places, different backgrounds. And I think you do not have to be embarrassed about it, but you should always, I think, go back to the community and really try to do you know, the little you can in sort of moving people from level A to level B, whatever, how much that Delta, you know, A, B is, you know, everything is appreciated. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, so I went to, you know, one of the schools that I went to was like uh, called, I think primary school was called, um, uh, I decided to start maybe uh, to go back to, uh, from a very early level because yesterday I just uh, jumped into one of these networking sessions and I, one of the guys I met was a high school student uh, from actually from Hong Kong. So I realized actually that this talk, I had started at a different point, mostly just college level going up. And then I realized actually, you know, we have people from different levels and I decided, okay, maybe I'll share my sort of uh you know experiences during high school if we have a high school student maybe they might pick one or two things hopefully so you know my primary school was in a school called saint peter clava and you know when i went there you know this was not one of the great schools in zimbabwe for like the past 15 years before i'd come there they'd never get anyone with like complete points so after 15 years i think myself and one other guy were really sort of the two people that could actually you know had perfect points then. So it was really self-belief. Uh, it was not the best molding situation, but you know, you just have to believe in yourself, you know, make the best out of it. Uh, and, and, and that was, that was what it was. And then, uh, after that, I went to what I called visitation Makumbi. I think here you see, uh, I'm the one kneeling down and those are two brothers. So I can add so many prizes. So they're holding some of them for me. And this was really, I think a fantastic time. Um, which I spent in Zimbabwe. Um, so this was a Jesuit school. Uh, so a lot of uh, Catholic influence. I think usually in my context, I think in Zimbabwe, uh, they have some of the best schools. And so throughout the whole trajectory, I think I started to study sciences. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you know, there was, I was very good in sciences. I was also good in, uh, in humanities. So my selection on continuing in sciences is simply, you know, I basically weighed the factors in Zimbabwe. Like if I did sciences, basically, what would my future most likely look like? And if I did uh, humanities, you can be a fantastic writer, but you cannot really have a, a, a good living in Zimbabwe. It's really, really difficult. So that's why I actually, I actually ended up uh, picking the sciences. And actually after my A-levels, I actually applied for medicine and I got a place. I think it's really, so for me, medicine, I never really dreamt of myself as a medical doctor, but medicine was sort of a safe bet. You know, you, you, you have a good job. I knew academically I was good in it, um, but I have to admit, I think my heart was not in it. Um, um, so I was really glad um, that when I managed to move to Germany uh, to do something else, because either it was either medicine or anything else, but that gives you a lesser quality life. So I never wanted to, I was more like experimental, but this is something that it might, at that point in time in Zimbabwe, I think even now was something that is really not really promoted. 
Um, yeah, so next slide, please. So yes, I think during my high school, I think one, one group which was really important, I think, which, is, which has had a very central kind of part was called USAP. It's called the United States Student Achievers Program. So what this group does, um, it actually was part of the United States Embassy. So they would take um, uh, sort of usually the best students in Zimbabwe, usually 30 students a year. And then they would send them to different, uh, mostly to the US. So you get the facility because you have very good grades you know, I had 11 A's, other people had 13 A's, you know, they're really people with fantastic grades. And then they help you get scholarships at Ivy League institutions, and then you go to the U.S., right? Uh, so I was selected to be in this sort of uh, grouping. And, yes, yeah, so I was, I did my applications to go to the U.S. Um, I didn't quite like the U.S. educational system. I think I, I became too much, you know, focused into science, scientist. And, you know, most of you, you U.S. institutions like Yale University, Columbia, they are like, um, they have a lot of humanities. So you have this broad kind of concept. So I was not, you know, we're geekish science school that we're doing in Zimbabwe, you know, and I didn't have, you know, that open space uh, to, so I wanted to just do sciences and so forth. So, you know, so I was supposed to go to Florida to the technology. And then at some point I got the opportunity to actually, pre I was presented with a different university, which was Jacobs University Bremen which was like, um, it was very international. So I thought, oh, everybody is a foreigner there. If I go to the US, you know, most likely I'm the foreigner and everybody. So this was completely new and it was a lot of foreigners and the degree program was for three years. So I decided, okay, if I go to the US, it's four years. So if I go to Germany, I save one year. So I was like, okay, this is already looking good. Um, and then because of our host family, who kind of like a sort of family friend extension, who was in Germany, then I was like, okay, at least I have somebody I know. So this is in the end why I ended up being actually in that cohort of about 30. And you now see what you see here actually in this picture is actually what this grouping of this use of students, everybody going to the US and the guy on the right, the white guy on the right is the uh, US ambassador then. And the lady was the one in charge in red. And then I was the only one who actually went to Europe. Um, so I think it was a fantastic grouping and all these use of students, you know, they are in Wall Street, they're in um, doing big things in many different, um, in many different uh, sort of um, universities or companies. So it's a lot of wealth um, and a lot of knowledge. And actually I will talk, talk about later, but this is some of that wealth and knowledge that now we want to bring back because all these people are now successful. They're running their own companies. They are leading huge companies. And now it's like, can we harness all that knowledge and experience uh, back home and, and try to build something that is, that is really solid and that can really promote uh, sustainable growth? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, okay, I said, well, from my high school, I went, this is now Jacobs University, um, um, Bremen in Germany. So, um, uh, you can just click uh, at the next part. I think it is, a, it is an animation. You can go on again. I think, yeah, okay, fantastic. Okay, so this is a uh, university in, in, in Germany. So, it's very international. During my time, was actually, I did... Um, biochemical engineering actually was initially was a double major, biochemical engineering and mathematics, but decided to drop mathematics in my last, I think, year, and then just finish biochemical engineering. But I just decided, okay, uh, why am I suffering? Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion now, after all my experiences, that whether you do two or one degree, sometimes it really doesn't matter. But I think unless if you have a clear reason uh, why you're doing it. For me, it was simply because I was not challenged enough, but then, you know, things happened. Now, why I chose biochemical engineering, I think this might be also relevant to some people that are trying to say, okay, which degree programs do I do and, and what does it mean or do I get tied to it for, for forever and ever? Uh, I chose biochemical engineering actually while I was still in Zimbabwe. So I chose that. That's the program I applied to. And to honestly say, I had no idea what it was all about. Uh, I just liked the fusion between biochemistry and chemical engineering because I was like, okay, this is something cool. It's sort of, sort of interdisciplinary. It's somewhere in there. I'm doing my research and I'm not stuck in, in one little area that is sort of dogmatic. And, 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 um, and I have to say, um, this was a fantastic good fit for me 
you know for most people sometimes it's not the lack of intelligence that is really the problem but finding the right thing that suits you uh, which is really I think which is really the big sort of barrier uh, to success uh, so this is what I did I think it was um, and we had many different students I think we had almost 12 in my, so there were small classes because the pri it was the first private university in Germany which was not in sciences which was not quite liked uh, because Germans are not used to the concept of private universities um, but it was really unique for small classes I think there were 12 students per professor and in my class because it was so international it was almost every student was from a different country so everybody was weird in their own way so it was really good everybody just fits in you learn you know I, I thought you know many people would feel like we're really ignorant about Africa forget many other African countries I think after when I came to Jacobs, I really realized I didn't know many countries at all. You know, I was very ignorant. Uh, you know, you knew all these big countries like, okay, in Germany plays football, uh, Switzerland, people put their money there, you know, and all this kind of sort of stereotype or big, 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 big stuff. But on East Europe, Bulgaria, I didn't quite know and many stuff like so I really learned a lot and I everybody will tell you a name of their own country and then you have to run and check it. So it was it was it was a good thing and also realizing sort of our ignorance from the African perspective because, you know, we, we, ex we also see that many people don't really know much of our countries. And then um, I think so. And then I did my master's. So after the three year bachelor program, I did my master's there. I think I had the chance to just do like um, molecular biophysics. So I think, so, you know, these are always kind of these fancy programs. I would say, you know, biochemical engineering is simply, uh, if I would explain what, what, what that was, is basically we are saying, um, can we use, it? you can do bioreactor design, like can we make biofuels? Can we use agar to produce energy? Can we use biomass? Can you make a yogurt? You know, so biotechnology basically, and you can be synthesized, so you might have a heart drug that is synthesized by a chemical process, but it might be cheaper to use an enzyme to do it, so, so a protein that you take from the cells. So you can really do all these kind of substitutions. So can we do that? Can we make processes faster? So you basically, what you are simply doing is you are trying to use, do chemical reactions and other sort of natural reactions by, by using bio, biology and biotechnology to do it. So you are really just, you know, harnessing our biology for, 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 for sort of industrial and commercial applications. And I did also my master, my, my master of science at the same university in biophysics. Um, why I chose this? Well, I think I liked one of my, this guy was shown the professor at the bottom, Professor Matthias Winterhauter. I think this is one, I think the best supervisor I ever had. And if I'm going to learn to teach something or, or share the most important thing that I learned, your supervisors really, really matter. Um, it, they, they can make or destroy. It doesn't matter how good you are. Uh, they, their input can really restrict your progression or it can really trust you uh, much more forward. And on top, as you can see, this was one of my graduation. I think this is my host dad. You know, this is also this part of networking. You know, I learned German because my host mom couldn't speak German. And, and this kind of host family kind of helped in the integration, I think, in this community. So I think this is really, I would say, you know, some of you remain in Af uh, different African countries. Some of you will get the chance to go outside. But I wouldn't take things like learning a new language for granted, integrating with a different community or a connection with your professors, because all this, you know, would, would really help you at any po at some point in the way. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, uh, yeah. So after the, the, the you know, the, my, mas my Master of Science, I, I applied to Switzerland uh, to do my PhD. Uh, so how I, how I did this, because most people might also want to know how to go about this. So in Europe, what I did was like I was reading some papers from this professor, from this guy, and I just wanted to work with him. I was like, OK, I plateaued in Bremen, so I need to I'm always reading these papers from this guy. Why don't I just go work with him? And then I know all he knows than trying to understand it on my own. So I just write this guy an email and just send him my CV. Apparently, the guy was really nice. I think within like four hours, he had just offered me the job. It's like, okay, you can come and so forth. And then I, that's how I went to Switzerland. Of course, I had also taken a trip 
uh, to Switzerland at some point during our biochemical engineering excursions. And I was like, okay, this is a beautiful country. I definitely want to be here. And also coming from Zimbabwe, you know, financial security. Um, so nothing to be ashamed of, 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 of taking into account sort of practical realities in your own, in your own life when you make such decisions. Um, but it's good that I could, I could basically satisfy sort of both demands. And then, then I was at the University of Zurich, I think for a while. Uh, and and the prof I was actually the only PhD student because this guy wanted to create his own group. Uh, somehow he had problems with the university. You know, I got in. You know, I had to move because he basically his contract of my boss, not mine, was not extended. And then I had to move uh, to a different university, which was actually which was actually not such a bad thing. And here is actually you can see that I was really one of the rare species, I think only the on, on one of the black guys, I think I was the only black guy there uh, playing football. I think I was still like kind of in my youth kind of, you know, baggish self, enjoying myself, you know, so, so, you know, was, was much fun. I think we had lots of, was lots of cool uh, football stuff. So I think I, my point is, you know, you can do all what you want, how great it is, but also have fun along the way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then, okay, from I moved, okay, to Switzerland, then I moved to the ETH, and then I did my PhD uh, in physical chemistry. So you can see, I, I basically changed my, 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 my degree, um, you know, a lot of ways. Uh, and this was a really um, sort of good time, um, you know, ha being at the ETH, I think was a, was a really, uh, it was a, it's one of the, I think, number five in the world. It's, it's a really big institution. The pressure is on. You have to really work hard. Um, I think you have to satisfy and so forth. And I had a weird supervisor. Um, he was really proud, I think, to have me and one girl who was there before me. A sort of, he had more blacks in the community than any other professor. So he was felt like he, he's the most empowering professor. So, you know, we had to live through that. Um, you know, you cannot just give up your PhD in the in the middle, but you know, it was you know one of those really kind of sort of setbacks. And I fought with this professor for for a very 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 um, hard, but you know, I managed to survive this. But it's a matter of character how you deal with these things, of course. Um, yeah, and then uh, next uh, next slide, please. And then I yeah, are you, uh, just one more click. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Just one band. Okay. And then I went to Münster, Germany. I did my postdoc. Uh, why I decided to actually go to Münster was actually an accident. I wanted to go to Basel and the professor was in Basel, but then when I applied, she told me she'd move to Münster. So I ended up back in Germany. It was not my plan. And there I did single molecule biophysics. So that means usually when you do re um, experiments, um, basically you see a lot of molecules at once. But you know, there's this high resolution technology or microscopes where I can see one molecule. It's like watching people from space. You have this averaging effect. You might not be able to tell that they are 90 year old and 15 year old, they are men and women. You just kind of see like humans as an ensemble. But if you take each human individually and look at them, then you can see these differences. So it's like trying to really understand sort of really, it doesn't matter reaction, which are, maybe it's an enzyme reaction production of some antibodies or some antibody binding and whatever, you can really see the difference between each antibody reaction. So it's really like the, the highest resolution you can get. So this is actually part of my work that was uh, published in, in one of the journals. So I just decided to show you some science, but I decided not to talk too much science in this talk. I'll just give you sort of overview. Uh, next talk. Uh, next slide, please. So in Minsk, I spent four years. I think uh, I had a very restrictive supervisor who didn't bit scared didn't allow us much to go to conferences or that and that and and you know there was a lot of restrictions then i did my, i went to a different another postdoc um in leipzig uh and now i was in Münster. i was in physical chemistry and now i'm like really pure physics so now i was a postdoc in physics a senior postdoc um you know i had a big grant that had applied through the way but it didn't work out um there are also issues there um, you know, it's, it's really difficult as a black man when you all start also going high up there because in the end, the last part of that grant, I had like almost 20 professors uh, interviewing me for this, it was I think 2 million euro grant. Uh, you, know, you know, it's very difficult to say, but I don't think very few black, any black persons made it. It's, it's a really tough call. Um, so anyway, we had um, single molecular biophysics and here, this is actually, I'm still in Leipzig. 
So initially I was a postdoc and my research is on CRISPR-Cas editing. So this is what uh, the sort of these molecular scissors where you can basically precision medicine, where you, if you have, there's a fault in the DNA, you can basically cut it out and, and you can seal it off and correct it. So this is sort of my research right now. Uh, so I'm not actually, I'm actually working with the other guys that did not win the Nobel Prize, but they're actually my, are the ones, my collaborators are sort of the one person who actually um, found, discovered CRISPR first before the other guys that, that won the Nobel Prize. So there's a big controversy over there. Right. So this is a cool technique uh, that I also want to bring to Zimbabwe because this is a very cheap technique. It has a lot of applications in sort of biomedicine, in sort of agriculture, creating crops that um, that res um, that respond very well to climate and so forth. Um, you, you can use it quite a lot, and or you can cut sickle cells, anemia out, all these mutations. Correct. You can do it at the gene level, whereby you really have permanent changes, but you can also do it at the RNA level, where you don't impose permanent changes. And this is also, I say this because you're also trying to address sort of um, ethical questions surrounding this, but these are the powerful technology that Africa definitely has to embrace um, moving forward to really have an, a, a wider impact um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the global scale. Um, yes, and I think it was, it is, yeah, Leipzig, and now, uh, now I have basically uh, also got now, I'm now a professor in Leipzig for physics and Bio, physics of biological and soft matter also tells you I have a very interdisciplinary background. I think I'm, a, I'm I also program. I'm a physicist. I'm a biochemist. I've been all over the place. Uh, and what is really led al along the way is really that I have central. I believe in the you know in back in the days you know physicists used to believe that no matter what you are doing basically they have this universality of forces you know you have like okay you have the magnetic force you have the gravitational force you have like whatever you can compose you can bring down everything to different forces that basically control the universe and i think i'm still old school um, about it because i think as a as a as a as a, as a researcher what i need is simply a set of rules and 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 um concepts and with these rules and concepts, I should be able to basically analyze any phenomena. And this is really my, my thinking and, 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 and also my, my, breath, my sort of my breath in terms of going all the different, uh, different, I have a lot of different techniques that I didn't really mention and so forth. And this is also because I wanted to go back home to Africa and, and to do something for myself to trans, you know, transport back this, this knowledge. But if you are too specific, you will lack um, a lot of things that you need partners to complement it. So you have to be a little bit broad to be able to do many things yourself. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, you can move on. Uh, again, yeah, thank you. So now, now this brings me, I think, to, to the last thing I wanna talk about, I think. Um, all my, my, my sort of experiences and knowledge and whatsoever has led me to actually me, you know, setting up an institute in Zimbabwe. This is like our building. And, and I believe strongly that, you know, this is called the Biotech Institute. We want to, I believe strongly in creation of sort of innovative infrastructure that is globally competitive. Um, in basically in any area, biomedicine, health or research and education, because I've, I feel like these are the things that are going to basically push us forward. And I, I, I strongly don't, I, I believe that you need a lot more of private, um, um, sort of private participation, especially in research, to basically chart the, the trajectory of our innovations and protect those inf innovations through patenting and, and whatsoever. And, and so this is really the strategy. We have four departments, I think research and education, molecular diagnostics, uh, technical services and distribution and consultancy. How this is set up, we really mostly a research and education. We want to teach people in genomics mostly, that's our whole focus area in biotechnology. But to be able to run an institution such like that in Zimbabwe, you need to make a little bit of money. You, you, I want the whole institution to be self-sustainable. I don't wanna keep begging. So if you start diagnostics, that means right now we do like COVID PCR tests. So you can do your COVID PCR tests, you make money, you take that money and you can invest it in research, right? So you can do also screening for TB or STDs. One, you bring that technology because there's nothing new about it. It's basically taking it from Germany, from Europe, and then applying it into the Zimbabwean context where it might not be there. 
and then basically you can make you can make a little bit of money and then use that money to basically research and education and what we want to do in research is basically to do to push like this crispr cas editing i uh, think in, in basically biomedicine and agriculture also going in the direction of personalized medicine we want to look at this antimicrobial uh, resistance uh, and how it affects africa and what we can contribute and one other area that is really important to us is basically can we extract the active compound from our traditional african medicines and basically patent this and create sort of a biotech industry right so we really should protect our traditional knowledge because there are many things that came from zimbabwe that you cannot bring to europe anymore because one of the other swiss or german companies basically took this and patented it so so we have to protect our knowledge and 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 for this of course um we need a lot of partnerships uh and here this is kind of like when I'm, i want to mention i'm a part of usop many students that went to the us and now we want all those students basically to be part of 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 this program uh through online lessons like they can really teach some of the program what they can in, in an online environment come back home do a sort of short course or or um, uh, what is it called um for one week or two weeks train a particular um technique and so forth and and also we have also this we have a sister company called mutapa which is in germany and this one also supports this biotech institute because it can operate as a german company it's a german company and it facilitates different things we you know so having a zimbabwean company and a german company uh, so this is now sort of my my sort of my uh plateau no, no yeah i'll say exactly this is now my axis my pivot now and and i would like to you know trying to bring as much people as possible we have some support from the swiss uh swiss embassy for instance we are also getting governmental support and and i think this is really the way we really want to push protect our knowledge uh get a lot of value into it teach people how to patent and 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 so forth and so forth so yeah and i think with this i would like to basically thank you for listening uh and thank the organizers for inviting me Thank you so much Brighton for that amazing amazing talk. I think people I could see in the chats also on social media your path has been long and winding and one jump to another very interesting uh, journey. So we have a couple of questions that came in from the attendees. So the first question is from Cosnet. So from your journey it sounds like you have made quite a number of jumps. So brave, not being afraid to move and change your mind it seems. What do you feel inspired that bravery every time you decided to change direction, drop something or move institutions? Well, well I think I think I would say um one one thing we, we for sure is actually my path is not disconnected. I think there is always a link. Um it's like uh, you when you move from biochemistry to physics, I may be looking at the same process but much more quantitatively. um and also i think if you are moving from one country to the other okay i was blessed many people would love to but they don't have that opportunity um it's even much more advantageous in research uh because you, people ask if you left the country you've done your phd and you have to leave you have, basically you have to leave uh and you have to have these experiences and you um so well you know as a let's say Well I've been let's say I was a single guy for long it was just me also that makes life easy that's that's part of the you just can take your bags and go if you have a family then you have to also count for other three you know 10 people I mean however many you are so it's also sort of maybe circumstantial depending on what at what point in my life I was um but I was I also enjoyed this I think it's it's a sort of personality issue and and you always want to learn the best and you just want to go where you think you can get it um i don't know i don't know i wouldn't call it bravery it was some fun sport you could call it a sport of some sort you know like you know other people like to jump out from planes and 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 not fall to the ground some people are scared it's just a different sort of you know sport but you know at the end of the day i want to learn as much techniques as i could because now when i go back home i can do this i can do that i can do that and do that I I need to program to be able to make my own software. I need to fix my machine when it's broken. I need to design the experiment. I need to manage the lab. So, you know, in that context you need all that knowledge. Absolutely. I definitely think the way you went through your career journey has set you up now for this bigger undertaking of the Biotech Institute. Absolutely. Yeah. Um next question comes from Olumi 
Olumoyiwa. I hope I said that correctly. His name, um, he, he or she asks, uh, I'm so inspired by your story. How easy was it to become a professor in Germany? I have my PhD from KIT and I'm a salute of courage. I didn't, I didn't get the last part. Um, they said that how easy was it to become a professor in Germany? They have a PhD from KIT and they must salute your courage. Okay, so so I think <laughs> I think it's not easy at all. I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if I'm the only ever black professor to become. I, mean, I would be glad to be surprised that there was some guy who came before, uh, especially in physics and things like engineering. Germans are really like on a different whatever. It's not easy. Um, it's 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 you know they don't even want to give you the funds for it it's very difficult to even get fund as a black man and without money you cannot become a professor i think i managed to do this the way i made it was rather radical uh and and it's also because of my teaching i think this one thing i didn't mention but i had like uh, our department is rated very poorly in teaching um and my courses were very popular <laughs> so students love my, my my classes so i think also teaching also helped uh, to sort of because German universities get money according to the satisfaction of the students. Um, so, you know, not with telling, not saying my research was not good enough, but I'm saying they may be to be able to make it, they need something supernatural, super extra uh, to, 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 to go the, you know, to, to go the route. And I mean, the east of Germany, which is even worse than the west. So it's, it's not an easy task and, and I wouldn't take it for granted. Uh, but the good thing is you can do it, you know, and, and also realize when you get to that level, the students have a lot of power. If, if you play well with the students, you can also negotiate a little bit better because if they get mad, the university has to react. Some great tips there for people who maybe want to follow something similar. <laughs> um, another question from Elvis. Um, he says most of, most of his peers doing PhDs in Africa feel doing a postdoc stagnation in Korea. How do you feel your two stints as a postdoc helps shape who you are as a researcher? And how does one balance the need to get a permanent position and furthering their research profiles? Okay, I have to say something. I, I hope I don't demotivate anybody. Um, um, I think postdoc is the most abusive time of anyone's career. Um, um, it, it's very abusive. Uh, I think, you know, you are just hanging in there you know, you know, there was a picture that always shows of somebody with a, like a fish hook with a carrot at the end uh, sitting on a, on a horse. And the horse tries to get the carrot, and, but it's moving forward and forward. Uh, this, is, this, is really, um, this is really it. And, and, you know, it's, and you are fighting for very few places because it's, it's like a pyramid, right? There are very few professors and, and people now live to 100 years. So, no, you know, the only thing that releases a professor is death. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not wishing for anyone to die. I'm just trying to really create the whole picture here. Uh, so there are not many places. And when, it, and when a spot pops out, anyone in the whole world can apply for it. For people from Japan, from Hong Kong, uh, from Zimbabwe, from, from the US. So, and you have to be a good fit. Um, so I think postdoc you should do, I did mine for too long. Um, way too long. Uh, there are reasons for it, um, but I would not advise to do postdoc more than four years. If you didn't get anything, just just do something else. You know, unless if you really love it. You know, you know. I think you have to be crazy to be in science, right? And you really have to have this neurotic and and obsessive obsessive you know part of it. Now you need it to be persistent. If the experiment doesn't work, you keep repeating it. But at the same time, you know, so you don't have to lose that because you need that to be to thrive in science. But at the same time, you have to be realistic about your personal life because I think postdocs, most of them are just abused. Yeah. It's a very interesting point and I think something to keep in mind, especially for people at the end of their PhDs or <laughs> postdocs, not sure what's the next step and maybe having that debate in their mind. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think final question comes from Valerie, and um, she says that uh, I think the Biotech Institute is a fantastic initiative. What do you think are the necessary skills for upcoming African scientists to push through this approach for African innovation? Um, so I think I think I think one one thing is is a there's a there's a big big sort of problems uh, how to it's it's the nature of our education. Uh, the will might be there, but the process which took you to the point you are 
shaped you in a way maybe that limits you to from doing it. Um, why I say this is like there are many capable people I've met in Zimbabwe, like from uh, Harare Institute of Technology, who have done biotechnology. And some of I've written, I've received a lot of letters, and some just write because we have biotech in our name, they write, ah, oh, Professor Samatanga, I've got my degree in biotechnology, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> um, can I pass by and you let me know what to do with my degree? And I think now you are kind of, you know, that means the system or the educational system failed them in trying to recognize the potential of their degree before they started the program. Right. In Zimbabwe, we have water pollution problem. You can clean that using biotechnology. Uh, we have electricity problems. You can create biogas and so forth and so forth. Um, the Europe wants, uh, you know, they're vegans, vegetarians, all these sorts of things, or other people, you know, it's fashionable. We can, we can, we can, we need organic manure. You can sell manure, you know, because it's as vegan as the manure or the fertilizer you used to put in it. So it's like, and, and we have a lot of that organic manure. But it's like somebody hasn't been told just like, oh, you, you know, you know, Mrs. XX, whatever, you just need to dig a hole over there, there's manure and you can sell that to Europe. They want to make vegan maize, right? So, so it's, it's this that structure. I think we have to really teach people to be entrepreneurial in terms of teaching them that the knowledge they get is not the end point or it's not where they're supposed to stop, but that's, they're supposed to pick it up and be innovated and use it for something else. And I think this is really, really important uh, that people really, you know, and people have to be bold enough to do it. Um, and people, of course, have to be sponsored and, and because some of this knowledge, how to interact with Europe, you know, there's always a lot of things and bureaucrats and somebody might be blocked. And that's where you need, I think you need, I think you need one or two, three, so that maybe in every country, about three institutions, maybe like mine, hopefully we make it, and these three institutions can promote this type of knowledge because I think they have to promote it. They have to kind of, you know, push a different kind of thinking. And, you know, and then at some point you get a movement. Absolutely, absolutely. And you are spearheading uh, an initiative like that with creating the Biotech Institute and hopefully this sparks other individuals to do something similar so we can start moving towards that. But yeah, thank you so much, Brighton. This is an amazing talk. So many amazing perspectives. Really appreciated you being here today. Oh, thanks. Yes. Thank you guys for inviting me. It was a pleasure. I think this is fantastic work. I think it's fantastic people. And I really hope everybody, wherever they are, in their own little way, you know, just contribute their one cents or two cents to the cause. Cheers. Thank you. Okay.